If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence. his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, your almighty power is made known chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Our first reading this morning for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost is from Ezekiel, chapter 2. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels, who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them. And you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second Corinthians chapter 12. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though, if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the Holy Gospel. <laughs> the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, 
Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is the pleasure of the Lord God, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we've been reading from the Gospel according to Mark over the last several weeks. We've been reading of how Jesus has healed many people, how he's calmed the, the wind and the waves. Last week, how he stopped a 12-year flow of blood and he raised a little girl from death. He showed his dominion, if you will, over all of creation, over disease, and over our greatest enemy, death. Now, there is a, a, a portion in there that we skipped over a couple of different things. One of them, if you'll recall, Jesus went across the lake, the Sea of Galilee, and on the other side, it didn't, we didn't read about what he did, but there he cast out that legion of demons from a man who lived among the tombs. It seems, you know, as we read all of these things, there's nothing that Jesus can't do. Nothing that's not within his power until today. When it seems that maybe Jesus can't do everything. Is it just because he's now home in Nazareth? Is it just because he's now here with all of these people with whom he grew up? Those that know him so well and have known him all of his life. I would say that yes, that is part of it. They think they know him so well that they know that he can't do these things. They doubt from the innermost part of their being. This, they look at him and say, is one that has grown up among us. If I can't do it, then I know he can't do it either. For those that, that were here last week, right, we had Pastor Brazina with us assisting, and then he spoke during the coffee hour. And if you weren't downstairs, hopefully you got to view it on Facebook or on YouTube. But one of the things that Pastor Brazina brought up is the fact that he now serves in a congregation where he has been all of his life, essentially. He grew up in that congregation, and everybody there, all the old members, they've known him all of his life. They still think of him, if you will, as little Davy. You know, that, that, that boy that, yeah, he was cute, but boy, wasn't he mischievous also. And as a result, he did say that there were some that didn't look at him as their pastor. He wasn't their pastor. I would say that's tragic. For here, as, as, as they look at him, it's, they, they don't accept what he says as a pastor. Which means they're not accepting the, the absolution that he pronounces. And it's not that they're simply rejecting, let's say, little Davy. They're not even rejecting Pastor Brazina. In doing so, they're rejecting the one by whose authority Pastor Brazina does speak. So in our text, Jesus, you know, we're early in Mark's gospel, but still, Jesus has been on the road for some time now. He's been, the notoriety of his name has gotten around. The word has gone out and circulated throughout all of the countryside, throughout Galilee, of how, you know, well he teaches. That he's not just a, a well-spoken individual, but he speaks with authority. And the word has gotten out that he does great signs and wonders from healing fevers and all manner of illnesses to taming even creation when it decides to act up. He forces the demons to obey him. And he reverses what no other man can reverse. That is death. Yet, he still Mary's son. He's still the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. And he still has his sisters that live here among us. 
If we put ourselves in the, in the mind, if you will, of the people of Nazareth, we look out the window and we say, that's where he grew up. He, just, he grew up just two doors down from us. He played with my children. He played with your children. I even remember the time that, you know, I couldn't quite get my front door closed and it creaked and everything else. Boy, he is a fantastic carpenter. He came over and he had it working in no time. And every afternoon, you know, when I go walking around getting my exercise, it's all those houses, that new development, you know, on the side of town. Those are the ones that he built. The fancy, the nice ones, right? I bet you they all respected him. For he is certainly a man that people would respect. But respect is not the same as faith. It is not the same that, as faith that looks to him and trusts that what he says is true, that what he declares is factual, and that what he says will happen does happen. It's not the same as faith that looks to him and believes that he is the Son of God come to save them. It's not even the kind of faith that trusts that he's even a prophet. In two weeks, we're going to have a voters meeting, an assembly after the 10, 15 service on Sunday. And there's going to be some form of a resolution as part of that meeting put before the congregation concerning the training and the subsequent calling of John Hutchins as an associate pastor. Should the congregation go ahead and vote, yes, we want to do this and take on this plan, all of you will have to learn to regard John a little differently. For while he may be and might always still be in some people's minds, nothing other than little Johnny, or for most of us, maybe that young fellow that has such a fine looking family, right? But he will become something different through that call. And we will all need to see him as a pastor of this congregation. One who has been vested with the authority of the gospel. One who has been called to administer those things that are proper to the office of the holy ministry. A ministry for which he would be called. Now he may always be little Johnny, but according to the call he would receive, he would proclaim the word of Jesus. He would exercise the keys and he would administer the sacraments. And thus he would do publicly the things of Jesus. And he would do them for the benefit of this congregation. St. Paul wrote and, uh, in 2 Corinthians how pastors are to be regarded as stewards of the mysteries. Well, in Nazareth, even the owner of the mysteries was shut down. He was not listened to, and he was prevented from healing those that just knew him a little bit too well, I guess. Perhaps they thought that if such was within his power, then why hasn't he been doing this all of his life? <clears throat> Why has he waited until now to bring this authority home? Well, as the saying goes, right, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Jesus had brought home his teaching. He had brought home his miracles to Nazareth. But the obstinance of those town folk, their refusal to believe, prevented them from receiving the very thing that he brought to them. He brought them life. And because it was Jesus, they refused 
to receive that life. They refuse to believe. And as our text now says, they are known, if you will, for their unbelief. That even Jesus would marvel over such unbelief. It would be much better if he were to marvel over their great faith rather than their tremendous unbelief. But even as Paul writes in our epistle today, right, it is, so it is with those who bring the gospel. Too many have some reason, I would say, to protest against the power of the gospel to save, no matter who speaks it. There is always some basis to reject what is offered. And so without faith, the word of forgiveness falls, if you will, on deaf ears. It's not received, even though it is offered to everybody. It is because this gospel is for everybody that the church is always on the move, just as Jesus sends out his disciples in our text, two by two, where he gives them the very same authority over the unclean spirits as he himself has exercised. He sends them out to tell of a savior, one that can bring restoration to their lives, both in body and in soul. And this is the very, the very same ministry, I would say, that we possess. It is what we also have been entrusted with. It is the ministry in which we are sent out together, if you will, as a pair, as a pastor and a congregation, much in the same way as the disciples themselves were sent out. We have preachers and we have hearers. We have those that administer holy baptism and we have those that diligently and earnestly bring their young ones to such a great gift. We work together in this way, exercising the authority of Jesus over unclean spirits and handing over the Holy Spirit who works faith and life eternal. We are, like the disciples, the church that is in motion. Now, while she may have a local congregation that is the church, she might have a fixed presence in the community. The church is always sending. The church is always being sent. The church is always in motion as she carries the gospel to others. You know, we've heard of shoestring budgets, right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about there. But it seems that the disciples in this instance weren't even given the shoestring. They were dependent solely upon the word of Jesus. They were dependent solely upon those to whom they were sent. If their message was rejected, they simply were to shake the dust off of their feet and to move on. If there was none to receive them, they continued their mission until somebody did receive them. I believe that we do have a similar opportunity before us. That is, an opportunity to carry the gospel to new areas and to support those who work in the field. It requires faith. Faith to go out without all of the things that we would normally take. This being 4th of July weekend, right? A lot of people on the road. But I bet you just about everybody that hit the road packed a bag. They made a few sandwiches and put in their cooler to take along with them. We're not the type to go out and do things without preparation. So it is a journey that I would say that is done in faith. For a congregation to train a man for the holy ministry and to work towards the establishment of, of the gospel and word and sacrament ministry in, in new locations, especially when the current budget, I would say, is sparse, one that has no room to wiggle, is a great leap of faith. It will take faith on the part of Redeemer Lutheran Church and on the part of all of the members 
that the gospel that we possess is even the gospel that causes demons to flee by one little word. That it is the gospel that restores those to the fullness of humanity before God through the waters of holy baptism. And that it is the gospel that sustains the Christian, that sustains the church on its way with the heavenly manna of Christ's body and blood. It will take faith on the part of, of uh, on our part, to receive that which has been given to us and to, to take a step out and to share it with the surrounding villages and towns. It will take faith to step out into that unknown without guarantees of success and to do so with a tight budget. It will take faith to believe that no matter how much effort we put forward, and no matter how much we give in that effort, what we have and what we possess is never diminished. We have the greatest riches in the world. If we combined all the wealth, let's say, of all of these new billionaires that are seem to be created every day, we could not purchase what we already have for ourselves in the spilled blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For there we have true forgiveness and we have lasting reconciliation with God. Something that cannot be taken away, something that cannot be made even less than for us, no matter how much of it is also given away. So I don't know how close we are to having a, a resolution, if you will, to, to send out for the congregation to deliberate. And I obviously make no bones about my opinion on that. Uh, I'm, I'm, that I think it is the thing that for us to do. But I also recognize that it's not the only thing for us to do. And that the, the heart of the congregation is what matters in this respect. And, uh, but as Jesus sends the disciples, so he does send us, and we are to do something, let's say. And if it's not this, then we will find something else. And I got a thumbs up from Paul, so the resolution is coming forward to the congregation soon for deliberation. So what I want to leave you with is a benediction. That God would, do, would uh, guide your deliberations and that he would guide your prayers in preparation, if you will, for this voters' meeting. And that he would give you a peace in what you think and, and what you believe to be the right way forward. A peace that passes understanding as he keeps your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. So in our prayers this week, we do have a couple of birthdays, both of them tomorrow, actually. Jacob celebrates a birthday, and Henry celebrates a birthday tomorrow. And then Matt and Erica celebrate an anniversary. I believe it's on Friday, uh, on the 10th. So with that, oh, and I, we add one name in our prayers as well, Charlie McIntyre. Um, this is Dolores' son-in-law, Sandra's husband. And uh, he is, he's suffering some physical ailments, and so we do include him in our prayers. So then let us uh, join together and pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all others according to their needs. <laughs> Heavenly Father, your son endured rejection in this world, and you lead us likewise through a hostile world that shows no honor to your church or its wisdom. Do not let us, though, lose heart. Rather, steal us for such opposition, and let us rest confidently on what you, O Lord, have said. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy God, your great and mighty work is to create faith by your Holy Spirit in the eternal blessings of your Son, Christ Jesus. And we implore you to make preachers effective to proclaim your prophetic word, 
and to remove all stubborn ears from our midst. Do not leave us without your word, but make uh, your home among us and restore the joy of your salvation. Sustain the leaders of your church, and most especially we pray for those of the LCMS, and make profitable their word among us, as we pray for Matthew, Timothy, Robert, and Donald, and for those who are now preparing for the holy ministry, for Joshua and John and Adam. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, soften the hearts of, of every home, Turn parents and children toward each other in love and in patience, that each would respect and trust on account of their faith in Christ. Banish every unclean spirit from our homes, those of impudence and stubbornness and rebellion, and sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, on this day in which we celebrate and remember our independence, we pray that you would protect and defend our nation from its enemies, support our leaders and preserve them from temptation. And may they seek your will as they do serve this nation. Though the work of all, um, through the work of all civil authorities, those that make, administer, judge, and enforce our laws, help us and enable us to live a quiet and peaceable life according to your word. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, in our weakness, we are strong for the sake of Christ, whose grace is sufficient for every need. Give comfort to those whose pain is chronic, whose sustained suffering is unknown, who wrestle with difficult thorns in, in body or mind. And for all who suffer and are tempted to despair, hear our prayers, especially for Ingo, Chen, Mark, Naomi, and Charlie. In weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, let us boast in Christ and in his cross, by which we and our sufferings are sanctified. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, out of your abundant blessing, you satisfy with Christ the bread of life. Give repentance and faith to all who commune this day, that finding refuge in your Son's true body and blood, we may taste and see that you are good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things, and whatever else you know that we need, we pray that you would grant them all to us, dear Father, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ who died and rose again, and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated. I do have just a couple of announcements. Um, obviously, I spoke of a voters meeting in the sermon, and uh, so in two weeks we do have a voters assembly after the 1015 service. I'm assuming we are going to have some type of virtual participation as well. You, you want to talk about it? Yeah, let me do a couple other announcements, but while you're coming up, then I'll do that. I did have the announcement in here about the ladies' Bible study on Thursday. That concluded last week, so um, please don't uh, uh, read that as if you can come this Thursday because nobody else will be here, okay? Um, and while I'm talking about Bible studies, we have a new one that begins this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., um, will the real Jesus please stand up? I've already ordered the books, so if, if you do still want to participate in that and want the book, um, I'm going to encourage you to buy it on your own. 
And, uh, but let me know that you want to participate in that. That'll be done via uh, Zoom uh, or some other teleconference uh, software. And I'll have to send you the link to join for that. And, uh, and if that's not enough Bible study for you, um, I did a, a Bible study with uh, KFUO on Thursday, pre-recorded it. It airs tomorrow, a Bible study on 2 Kings 23. It was fantastic for me in preparation, and there was a lot in that chapter that, uh, that I thought was just outstanding that relates to us very well in our day. So while we can't really pick it up on the AM dial here in Maine, you can listen to it online, and they'll post it on their website. And Thy Strong Word is the name of the Bible study, and, uh, and it's a, it has a podcast as well. So with that, I'll invite Paul up, and, uh, and he can speak to the Voters Assembly and everything that goes along with it. So, uh, we'll, we're, the, this is the official announcement that we're having a Voters Assembly in two weeks. Our bylaws require that I make this announcement two weeks at a time. I will be ducking out during communion to finish printing out copies for people who want a paper copy. And an email broadcast will be going out of the agenda and details and all the supporting information. The motion that Pastor referenced is on the last page. So you've got to go all the way to the end. I left the good stuff to the last, okay? All the easy stuff is up front. The thing that will probably end up using most of our time and discussion is the very last page of the packet that I'll, that I'll be handing out. On the packet, there will be instructions on, and I know you can't, you see, now, now this is just prop for the sake of prop. I know nobody can see this up there. But um, there will be instructions for a Zoom, for how to join us on Zoom. It has been made clear to me that the voting needs to be anonymous for this one. Okay, so I will have I have a scheme in my head for people that are joining on Zoom that will use one of those survey links that I used. I'll publish that during the meeting, so you can't stop the ballot box. And uh, for those at home, you can uh, then vote on it uh, anonymously during that, and we'll get that real time there. For those here, we'll be using a paper ballot for that. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Questions. Uh, I have the church. I'm going to have to dump out here. Gene, home today. Write a proxy and give it that permit. Yes, we will. We will work with. Yes, I will accept proxies. the The problem that comes with proxies that we ran into last time was that if we make a a amendment real time, it invalidates the proxies. However, given the type of motion it is, if we make an, a significant amendment to it, we have to kick the whole thing out another two weeks and give everyone a chance to review it. At least that's my interpretation. So, sure, run with it, okay? Any other questions? All right, thank you very much and have a great 4th of July. Yes, we have we have another announcement, Tom uh, here. So. We're starting a new initiative. Stand up, Miss Dear. She knew it would be okay. <laughs> um, we're starting a new initiative in church. We're trying to collect uh, material for all those people that are standing on the street corners, uh, you know, with the homeless, okay, um, that are asking for food and stuff like this. We're putting bags together, various things, socks, uh, trail mix, all sorts of stuff. It's in your uh, bulletin here, and in a few weeks, uh, we're, we're going to bring a box in next week and just throw your stuff in, and then in about a month, maybe we'll start putting bags together. So if anybody's interested in this, just read it. Anything you want to add? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the bags will be available for you guys to pick up and take with you with your cars so that you can hand them out uh, when you see somebody in need. Okay, so, so we're doing this not to just hand over all of them to some other organization. These are for our members to carry with, to have something to give to the homeless right, when, we, exactly. when we come across them. And okay. they need to throw in a track from the church. To okay. We are. We Fantastic. We do it in conjunction with the um, evangelism uh, committee. Um, actually, the idea came from them. So. Okay. Well, fantastic. That's it? Yeah. So God bless all that are with us. Have a wonderful 4th of July on this cool summer day.